Hello and welcome to today's Medicinal Monday on the Alter Your Health podcast. I'm Dr. Susanna Alter. And it's Dr. Ben here. And we're both naturopathic doctors who support individuals in reversing disease and reclaiming optimal health through whole food plant-based nutrition and mind-body medicine. So today on Medicinal Monday, which is actually Tuesday, sorry we're a day late, we were uh, traveling yesterday, um, but we're excited to talk about ears and keeping your ears healthy. Of course, we're working our way, altering your health from head to toe. We talked about eyes last week. And uh, when it comes to ears, there's definitely a lot that can be said, but um, the ear does so much, right? Of course, the ear hears, and then there's the vestibular complex within the ear that's responsible for maintaining our, uh, our proprioception and, and kind of um, balance and equilibration equilibrium in the world um and then there's of course kind of the 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 other conditions of the ear like you know tinnitus and other other kind of nuanced conditions that can occur uh, but this episode is really going to be focused on the outer ear so to speak and you know on this side of the uh you know eardrum which is more problematic and prone to ear infections, specifically, you know, the classic otitis media or infection of the middle ear, middle ear uh, which is for sure most common in children. Right. Yes. And so even though, you know, we definitely think of our kiddos as being the population that is more prone to these inner ear infections, um, it can happen at any point in life, right? right. We can get uh, we can get a bad cold and, you know, we just we feel our ears plug up and it can it can continue on into a full on ear infection. So this information should be relevant for everyone. Also, I'm sure all of the listeners out there probably know someone some somewhat close to you who has a baby or maybe is your grandchild, your grandchild who maybe gets frequent ear infections. So we're going to talk all about ear infections and really, you know, what are the major lifestyle risk factors that can majorly contribute to reoccurring ear infections. Totally. And I've, I think that you, you found a pretty astonishing statistic that uh, one in three visits to a pediatrician's office is due to otitis media or a common ear infection. And of course, that generally results in the prescription of antibiotics. And then generally, that kid is going to come back again for another round of antibiotics, another ear infection, couple few times and then maybe the 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 recommendation will be a surgical intervention of placing ear tubes in which is really just opening up the eustachian tube so that there can be proper drainage and i guess this is kind of bringing us already into a little anatomy physiology conversation so maybe we should just like outline essentially what's going on in the ear that can become inflamed infected and uh, what's really causing that process, you know, physiologically. Yeah, well, I guess, you know, the, the pathogenic uh, process of an ear infection uh, generally happens with inflammation in our nasal passageways. It starts with either uh, an upper respiratory infection or allergies, where that nasal inflammation actually affects the function of our eustachian tube. And yeah. the eustachian tube has many different functions. Um, it helps to drain fluid from the middle ear. And well, first, the eustachian tube is just essentially connecting the ear to the throat. Mm -hmm. or the back of the mouth mm -hmm. um, and it's a literal tube that is meant is, is meant to you know allow for drainage and communication and flow of mucus and whatnot between our air and and that's and that when we like pop our ears or when our ears get clogged and we pop it that's opening up the eustachian tubes um, which is important to maintain open that so to, to maintain the openness uh, right so the the feeling of clogged ears the feeling of like stuffiness and clogged ears is is essentially the blockage of the eustachian tube right and maintaining the openness of the eustachian tube which we can do um of course like mechanically if you will is important but we can also create the environment nutritionally biochemically physiologically that allows that eustachian tube to stay open and it's really you know decreasing the allergenic response and also the mucogenic mucus um, production in the system 
Definitely. Yeah, but what happens when we lose function of that eustachian tube, there's a eustachian tube blockage, is that uh, all of a sudden we can no longer, you know, have that proper drainage of fluids from the middle ear secretions. Um, you know, we also no longer have that protection against our nasal pharyngeal secretions. And uh, the pressure can get all wonky in that middle ear. And all, all of those things can set us up for a secondary bacterial infection. And that's what that ear infection is. Right, which is essentially just that opportunistic overgrowth of bacteria. And, you know, I think it's always helpful to consider kind of the, the metaphor of a stream, you know, and, and it's like you got a stream and it's a nice flowing stream and healthy and beautiful. And you got the lily pads and the fish. And then you dam up that stream or that stream becomes stagnant in some way. And then you got more algae growth and it's kind of becomes the swamp. And then you don't really want to go swimming in there, right? <laughs> it, it becomes kind of nasty. And, and there, there, that leads to this ecological imbalance um, when, you know, translated into our body that results in symptoms, really. Right. So that's, that's kind of just, I guess, bringing up this terrain theory versus our you know germ theory where it's just about killing that germ but but that germ is an opportunistic buddy right right yeah. so how can we support our respiratory passageways uh, our mucosa our eustachian tube so that we can prevent ear infections from happening in the first place yeah. and if we look at the major risk factors that lead to an ear infection um at the top of the list is actually consumption of dairy. Yeah, all, all of these risk factors are really, you know, dietary lifestyle things. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of people might have the tendency to just think, oh, you know, ear infections are common. There's, it's just the way it is. Maybe there's genetics, maybe there's anatomical things. And for sure, you know, genetic and an anatomical things might provide more um, susceptibility. But in terms of what's actually the cause, it's all it's all environment and lifestyle stuff, you know. Um, so, yeah, dairy being maybe at the top of the list because of the um, the way that dairy allow or causes the body to produce more mucus um, due to the immunological effects that dairy has on our system, the hormonal effects that dairy has on our system. Um, but maybe in addition to that is kind of the the breastfeeding. You well, know, yeah, for, for kiddos, totally. But I think that? I think it's more important first to just to, to really just talk about dairy because it is such a major, major factor. Yeah. Uh, 40 to 50 percent of children who have reoccurring ear infections have it due to chronic allergies. Now, those chronic allergies are uh, <laughs> in the majority of cases dietary uh allergies or sensitivities but well, uh really you know yeah. when it, when we're talking about dairy um dairy is an extremely you know kind of immune provoking food it really kind of activates the immune system to become hyperactive and create more sensitivities and i'm sure we'll talk a lot more about allergies and um the immune system that's a complex thing I, it's going to be hard to do it within the context of just a short podcast episode to really understand what's going on uh, but when you said like food sensitivities and these, you know, immunological stressors, th these food sensitivities and immunology in, in things that we consume dietarily can also make us more susceptible to the dust and pollen and grass and pets and, and those kind of environmental allergies, um, because it's really just this load in the body that gets uh, strain that starts straining the immune system. For sure. So yeah, so there are so many cases out there where the one thing that the family does uh, to help the kiddo with, with chronic or reoccurring ear infections is take dairy out of the diet mm -hmm. and boom, things clear up. They don't come back. It's that profound. You've had, <laughs> I remember, I mean, we don't see that many children in person, um, but certainly, um, you know, you- When we were in school. Yeah, when we were sure. in school, there are many, many cases of of that classic, just like try avoiding dairy. And it's such a great testament to just the healing power of the body because we think about ear infections like, what am I lacking? What do I need? What do I need to heal? And really, it's the obstacle that we need to remove. Mm -hmm. Like, that's rule number one of just healing naturally is what are the obstacles that are creating the conditions for this, this uh, symptom or disease? Uh, 
you know, sometimes it's hard to find those obstacles, but sometimes they're blaring you right in the face, like as is the case with uh, dairy products. And that even goes for the grass fed, fed free range stuff. Um, you know, of course, that that stuff is going to be better than any sort of conventional dairy products. But a lot of the, the 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 proteins and immunological agents that are going to put a strain on the immune system are naturally occurring. They're not the antibiotics that are added to conventional dairy products or any sort of, you know, herbicides or pesticides that are bioaccumulated in the dairy products. It's just the natural occurring uh, proteins and uh, hormones in dairy. Yes. Yes. So now we'll go through a few other risk factors that have been documented in science. And um, yeah, you wanted to talk a little bit. Um, the next one you wanted to talk about was really breastfeeding and the research behind breastfeeding. And it's actually shown that if children are or infants are breastfed for less than six months, there's actually a decrease in immune function. Because what that uh, breastfeeding does is it helps to provide secretory IgA, which is an immunoglobin, but other immunoglobins and prostaglandins that- Immunoglobulin. Sorry, immunoglobulins <laughs> and other silly. prostaglandins um, that really help that that baby's development of their immune system. Um, so that's major. And then, of course, you know, when the child is breastfeeding, then they're not getting a major source of their nutrition from a dairy based or soy based formula, yeah. which those are two foods that um, kiddos can end up being sensitive to. Yeah. So I guess, you know, for those who are not unable to breastfeed for whatever reason, I, it, it's that much more important to be really mindful of what that formula is. You know, if is that formula going to be optimal for the for the kiddo? And obviously, like breast breastfeeding, breast milk is like the the gold standard for for baby nutrition. Um, but there's a lot of things, and we're going to be learning all about that. I'm sure, even though, of course, we hope that the breastfeeding is the <laughs> it's going to be easy and great. And I trust that. Yeah. And one more benefit of the breastfeeding, just um, the, the sucking action mm -hmm. that is really required more so in breastfeeding also helps with the development of the facial muscles and just also other anatomical features that, that helps, um, you know, that, that formation of the nasopharynx so that it just helps to keep the eustachian tube open more so. Yeah. It's also a better feeding position. And that's another big risk factor for ear infections is if um, a baby is fed kind of while laying down, um, that can essentially uh, just set up, I don't know, set up um, anatomically, the eustachian tube is more likely to get clogged in that position. Cool. Yeah. So the next kind of category of risk factors are those environmental things that are going to increase susceptibility to, you know, the, uh, the allergic response really, you know, and these are things like mold, you know, moldy environments or lots of, um, you know, uh, chemical contaminants in our air that is really causing that, that chronic irritation of our respiratory system. Um, also things like smoking, of course, uh, secondhand, secondhand smoke. smoke, third hand smoke, whatever it might be. Um, and, uh, what else, what, are, what other environmental well, yeah. things, anything else? Those are the major ones. And cool. remember the whole point is we want to really set up the, the kid and ourselves for success to, uh, have a healthy mucosa of our respiratory system totally. of our nasopharynx. Yeah. Um, so. because really, you know, back to what you were talking about, like where these, uh, ear infections come from it's kind of a sequelae or a secondary effect of an upper respiratory infection and or allergies, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, it kind of goes hand in hand, hand. And of course, I think because of the ana anatomy of the, of the children, there's just a more likelihood of that respiratory infection kind of moving into the ear as opposed to moving down into the lungs, for example, for bronchitis or pneumonia, which is, you know, for sure more common in like older people. Yeah. Um, yeah. The children's eustachian tubes are actually shorter and surrounded by way more lymphatic tissue. Right. So that can mount a much more immediate immune response. Just a closer proximity to like, oh no, the ears are involved. Um, Whereas, in, again, in the case of uh, adults or older people, things generally don't go to the ears quite as often, go down 
go down if we're, <laughs> if we're not if we're not careful and uh, have our immune system in a robust state. Yeah, and then the the net, I guess the last or you know second to last risk factor we'll mention is also um, nutrient deficiencies, whether that's calorie deficiency or um, protein deficiency, which comes hand in hand with caloric deficiency, or deficiency in our essential fatty acids, or deficiency. Any other micronutrients. Yeah, any other micronutrients, especially vitamin A, vitamin D, and zinc, because those are the nutrients that are so important for. A balanced immune system. Yeah. So those nutritional deficiencies, you know, in a nutshell, putting someone at risk for that immune compromised immune status, um, amongst so many other things. So of course, eating enough of the good whole foods is is important. And, and of course, getting enough if, if the baby's, you know, not eating that many whole foods, just getting enough nutrition is so important for the immune system. And of course, everything else. Right. Yeah. So the next, uh, what's the last one here? The last uh, risk factor is just craniofacial anatomical abnormalities. Um, so, you know, that's something like a, someone being born with a cleft palate might predispose someone to more ear infections. But, um, you know, these are things that are still going to benefit so much from optimizing our yeah. lifestyle and diet. Right. So oh. um, no matter, you know, what, what uh, anatomy, no matter what, anatomy we're born with, we can always optimize our body's healing ability, right? 100%. So that kind of allows us to shift gears into considering the natural treatment options. And of course, there's the prevention, and then there's the treatment, right? Like, so, so of course, uh, at the top of the list are all of these things that, of course, come with prevention, really removing the risk factors, removing the dairy, removing the seasonal allergens, uh, removing all of the things that, that can compromise the immune system, uh, removing the nutritional deficiencies by eating enough of the good stuff. Um, and uh, so that's kind of the, the diet and lifestyle stuff. And then in terms of, you know, herbs and therapeutics, of course, it goes without saying that all of this should be considered, you know, not as medical advice, but as information and for sure consult with your natural functional primary care doctor whoever that might be before undergoing any of these treatments even though they're really you know safe and effective but you know not we're not giving any specific advice for your specific condition because otitis media i guess it goes without saying maybe we should have said this to to start you know it can be a risky thing because it can move into an inner ear infection that can be more problematic um but Generally, you know, when caught early, things can be managed very, um, very well without any sort of invasive therapeutic conventional treatments. Right, right. And let's just talk about that conventional treatment or, or you know, the most common conventional treatment before I go into natural, natural treatments, um, because anti antibiotics, I mean, this, this is like the condition where there is the most over prescription of antibiotics. Yeah. And the tricky thing is that when someone does take antibiotic a uh, round of antibiotic after round of antibiotic, um, that actually makes us more prone to those chronic allergies that make us more prone to developing reoccurring ear infections. Um, because of its effect on our gut health. And we know right. the link between gut health and the immune system, right? So yeah. yeah, so it can be kind of this vicious cycle. And the truth is these natural therapies are so, so effective. And I actually, I wanted to just um, reference this one study that was done in naturopathic treatments. And because there's not that many studies out there um, that are like this, where there were 24 children between the ages of two and seven um, that all had otitis media. All cases were treated with whole practice naturopathic treatment, including a botanical formula, which we can talk about in a little more detail, nutritional supplementation like vitamin A, C, and zinc, uh, a low antigenic diet, and hydrotherapy, for example, alternating hot and cold compression to the oracle or constitutional hydrotherapy. And then 75% of uh, those participants received a homeopathic remedy and 54 received a botanical analgesic, analgesic to help with the pain, um, an eardrop. And uh, the number of children with pain within 24 hours of that treatment was seven out of the 24. And no child had pain by days uh, 
two through seven. So, okay. So some, some people, it seems like maybe a few children had some lingering pain, um, up to seven days, but, uh, but within seven days, all 24 people had resolution of their symptoms. That's a better way to put it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, and with, yeah, within, within just one day, uh, about a third of, of people had resolution of their symptoms. And the only adverse event was one patient who discontinued the eardrops due to not liking the garlic smell. Oh, you yes. just, you just gave a hint away. Yes. So gar garlic <laughs> is, yeah. So, uh, let's run through this real quick, kind of some natural treatment considerations, of course, removing the obstacles, um, Maybe the, the first thing to consider is that hydrotherapy, just because it's so easy, mm -hmm. so easy. And um, you mentioned the, the alternating compress, just like hot and cold, like a, a washcloth, hot washcloth, you know, and then wring it out, get a cold, cold washcloth and then alternating, you know, um, 30 sec or thir three minutes hot, 30 seconds cold is generally kind of a good uh, alternation between the hot and cold to move the lymphatic system, move the circula circulatory system and kind of draw, draw fresh blood and energy to that ear, to that area. Yes, exactly. But yeah, going back to diet, you know, we definitely want to avoid those food triggers. We want to avoid dairy. We talked about that. I said it three times. I know we said it three <laughs> times. Sorry. Okay. So yes, we already mentioned the supplements that can be helpful. The immune boosting nutrients, vitamin C, vitamin D, zinc. Um, so there's a wonderful treatment, uh, an ear oil that has garlic has garlic and also mullein. And um, these drops, when applied to the ear, can help reduce pain, but can also help clear the infection because that garlic is so antimicrobial. So I've never done this, never like had... Uh... That, is this something that you can get over the counter? Is you, this you yeah. make it at home? Yeah, yeah you can buy drops. I thought so. Yep. I was, just wasn't sure if you knew. Yeah, but cool. you can also make your own by just kind of chopping up garlic and letting it sit in some olive oil and then strain out the garlic pieces. Yeah, um, so in, an oil infused with garlic and mullein. And usually yeah. what people do is they'll put a few drops on a cotton ball and then stick the cotton ball in the ear cool. so you're not actually dripping. You wouldn't want to do this if – you suspect or your doctor suspects that the uh, eardrum is perforated um, because you wouldn't want to put any external anything into the uh, middle ear that's Maybe already trying to clear. That that should have been much earlier in this conversation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, look at the eardrum. Of course, uh, if you don't have an otoscope, um, if you probably don't have an otoscope, go to the doctor, see what's going on and get the diagnosis before um, before trying Doing any, any of this, it, trying any of this stuff. Oh, for sure. Um, so this is all just information for you to take in. Right. right. Uh, so we'll get to the herbal stuff because that's kind of, I don't know, maybe more, you know, more difficult to get your hands on potentially. The other thing that's really kind of cheap and easy or free and easy is that ear, mm, the, so the, the, yeah. the, oh, ear, the J poles, the ear J pole where you're kind of like, tug on the eardrum or earlobe and pull it down and kind of yank it forward and kind of just go through this yanking motion. Um, and that what that does theoretically, hopefully, is pull the eustachian tubes into position to open up, it to open up and kind of start draining. Mm -hmm. um, so that is kind of hand in hand with like lymphatic massage, just kind of, you know, nice little rub of the neck and lymphatic chain that kind of moves things in that area. Right. Yeah. And then there's the herbal formula, which is, you know, things like uh, echinacea and hydrastis or golden seal, um, licorice, sim, uh, elderberry, all, all these kind of immune classic boosting. immune boosting herbs that, you know, there's great um, kids formulas that are like glycerites or alcohol free um, that are like, you know, glycerite tinctures of these uh, herbs concentrated that you would take internally, internally. yeah yes yes and Is then of course it? the last thing that was mentioned in the study was homeopathy which you'd have to see a um classical, a, homeopathy. A classical homeopathy practitioner for um and we love homeopathy but yeah it's just nice to know that there's all these options out there right sure options are good so <laughs> whenever you're faced with one option antibiotic surgery look more broadly open the eyes and hopefully um doctors and practitioners are able to do that as well right great so thanks so much for tuning in to our ear 
episode. Of course, like you said in the beginning, Dr. Ben, there's so much more we could have talked about, but we wanted to focus on a condition that um, is so affected by lifestyle, right? I mean, hearing conditions, mm -hmm. you know, yep. there's, there's a little less to talk about when we're talking about diet. Still, and still a lot to talk about, still but lot to talk hopefully about. this helps us to stay informed and empowered when it comes to our kids health probably unless there's any like you know seven or eight year olds <laughs> listening to the podcast <laughs> um but you know tell your parents if you're listening <laughs> uh just kidding yeah. but anyways we look forward to seeing you guys next time on the alter your health podcast bye for now